recently Victoria Nuland was in Kiev. She was meeting with Zelensky. In your opinion, what was the reason behind this trip? And what's going on right now between Zelensky and Zeluzhny? And what I think is happening is a political crisis be, being kept down right now, fairly artfully, I guess I would say. But, you know, the general's ratings are higher than the president's ratings, although the president's ratings remain fairly high. But I don't see those ratings just like I don't see Biden's ratings remaining high. I see them going further down and further down. The general doesn't have anything that would weigh him down, at least not right now, with regard to those ratings. So if I were Zelensky, I would be in a pickle, a political pickle. What do I do with this man? Because he looks like he might threaten me. And even though if I were Zelensky, I'd want out of there. <laughs> but I don't think he does. Power's gone to his head, you might say. Um, so he's got a political problem. Ukraine's got a problem from the perspective of one, it is so clear now that it has lost that I think even some of the idiots in the world who were prognosticating about a great Ukrainian victory, like General David Petraeus, are beginning to hedge their bets. They're beginning to back off a little bit. I think we're seeing a lot of the commentary that was chinned up simply to feed the military industrial complex and to essentially keep everything going, keep the plants going, the presses going and everything else. I think they're slowing down a little bit now, too. And I think most important of all, because domestic politics dictates so much in America, I think President Biden is beginning to realize there are some disadvantages to this, just as he is with Gaza. Um, he's losing a lot of voters. He's losing some of the people he's going to need in the Congress to handle some major domestic problems, um, not least of which is the border security um, and he's losing them in ways that he probably shouldn't be. And one of them is over his, they think, waffling on Ukraine. Some of them are on one side. You should be more harsh about it. You should put more in there. And others are on the other side saying primarily $34 trillion aggregate debt. And you're handing over another 11, 10, 11 billion to Israel. And you want to give another tranche to Ukraine. Um, this is nonsense. So he's got some domestic political problems. But I've Back to your question, I think Newland's over there because she's the one who knows how to say fuck the Europeans, you know. She's she's the bitch dog. She's the slap dog. She's over there to do whatever's necessary to deliver Biden's mes message to Z Zelensky. And let me say something else here. I was coming back on the train today from lunch down in Washington. I just sat down and I said, let me let me draw a little map right here right now. Okay, let's look at what's happening. Let's move from north to south in the eastern part of Ukraine. Luhansk, Donetsk, Mariupol, Stepnorsk, Kherson, down to Crimea, all in Russian hands. Oh, I'm Putin. I'm looking at that and I'm saying, where is the crown jewel? Where is the most important port on the Black Sea? Where's the port Alan First writes about in all his World War II novels? <laughs> the place where everyone wants to go, the place where everyone wants to be, a lot of criminal activity, but a great port. I'd want Odessa if I were Putin. So here's Clausewitz coming in again. Every day that a war goes on, objectives change. The more they change, usually accompanies victories or a sensation of victory. Then all of a sudden, the political objectives for which you began the war, Lavrov and Putin, very honest, I think, security, not territory, security. But if I'm thinking about it from their point of view, why don't I put the cap on my ultimate security from a military point of view and take Odessa? So if we don't go to the table pretty soon, if we don't start negotiations, if we don't slap something down on the table and begin to negotiate, get it negotiated, ceasefire first, of course, and then start talking, we're apt to lose Odessa. Kiev, Kiev is nothing. You know, they can have Kiev. All they do in Kiev is meet for politics and corruption. That's about all they do. Uh, it's a capital of Ukraine. Okay, fine, you can have Kiev. I do not need Kiev, but boy, I really would like to have Odessa. That's the way if I were Putin's military leadership right now, I would be thinking, and I think I'd be advising Putin to that effect. That's not good.
when you look at the Lansky's advisor, Yermark recently said that we don't need a backup plan. We don't need a plan B. What the Biden administration is doing to change this kind of mindset that they're having right now? I think that's why Newland's there. I mean, she is an attack dog. Um, and I think that's why she's there to sort of present that situation to him. I don't want to compare Zelensky to Hitler, but I will remind you that Hitler headed for the bunker with the pill uh, and was still sending people to their death, uh, children and old men to their death. So it's not a new phenomenon that a leader becomes so enraptured with his own leadership and with his own situation, political and otherwise, that he does stupid things, really stupid things. You know, all you have to do is look at America during the 2002 to 2009 global war on terror to see leaders doing stupid things. Um, or Bill Clinton uh, expanding NATO to 31 countries, the last eight or nine of which couldn't pass the smell test for entering NATO. And that's another problem we've got going. Putin arrested the dissolution of NATO for a few, a few months, maybe a year or two. But with Germany heading down the way it's heading, economically speaking, and the alternative for Deutschland headed up for the in the polls and ready to take over the leadership. I think that chancellor is down around 23 or 24 percent right now. Um, we're looking at the dissolution of NATO building, even as I talk. And these countries we've taken in at the end to make the 31 are part of that problem. And I, I don't know what's going to happen to the alliance in the next five to six years, because I do know that in 10 years, I think it'll be gone uh, as a political and a military entity, but it doesn't have to go as fast and as rapidly and for the reasons that it's going. And the only reason that, uh, uh, significant reason that it isn't our astuteness, it isn't the German astuteness or French astuteness or Finland coming in or anything like that, that's stopped it, it's Putin's invasion. That, that's what stopped it. And even maybe you could say caused the Scandinavians to come in and abandon years of neutrality policy. I think they'll figure that out pretty quick when they get new uh, new leadership, and that'll be it for NATO. So what's the plan for the aftermath? I see no geostrategic expertise in this administration. More disquieting for me is I see none on the horizon. And we are wandering around in the world lost. We don't know what to do except bomb people. Look at what we're doing now in the Middle East. We are the greatest impetus for a wider war. And yet we have a president who's talking about, oh, we'll just do this, 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 and this, and this, and he's going to do it all with bombs, and we'll keep it from being a wider war. We won't provoke anybody to do anything else, when the real reason for the whole thing is Gaza. Gaza is the provocation, and he's ignoring that, except maybe lately he's beginning to come to his senses. I don't know. But the first thing I would do if I were he is I'd send a Victoria Newland type to Jerusalem and I'd lay down an ultimatum. This is the sine qua non for my support to continue. Do you understand this? That's Latin for without this, you ain't getting nothing. Get rid of Netanyahu and make sure that standing at the door of the room he exits, there's a guard or two and a justice or two, and a lawyer, because he's going to jail. Get him out of here. Now, people say, oh, no, the next person to take over will just do the same thing. Au contraire. They won't. Netanyahu's whole life, his whole ideology, his existence is wrapped up in continuing this war, and as brutally as he possibly can. Uh, you say, oh, well, Smotrich or Ben Gavir or somebody might step in there. They're not going to step in there because the rest of the cabinet won't allow them to. Maybe they might even get rid of them. That's what you have to do. And Biden's got to wake up to that. And Blinken and Sullivan and all the rest of that pussyfoot and gang have got to wake up to it. Biden, Biden's losing votes now amongst progressives because of Gaza. He's losing them because of Ukraine. He's losing them because of Gaza. He's losing them because of Yemen and what he's doing in Yemen. Um, you can't lose too many votes and not have, especially if it's going to be Donald Trump, someone on the other side 
win the election. German Defense Minister just yesterday said that Germany should prepare for decades of war with Russia. When you look at Russia's behavior during these 19 months of war in Ukraine, they didn't even cross the Nepa River. Oh. Why they're so afraid of Russia marching toward Europe? They're talking for decades. I'm glad you brought the Nepper up. <laughs> That's the other thing I'd be talking to him about if I was his professional military leadership. <laughs> but I, I really think Lavrov and Putin signify the civil side of the civil military relationship, regardless of what we think of it. Autocratic dictator, call it what you will. I, I went through this with the Soviet Union when I was working on global war plans. And I kept telling some of the people I was working with, no one is monolithic. No one makes decisions alone. No one. Maybe Stalin came close, and at the end, Hitler came close. But everyone has someone or some ones who advise them. And in the case of Lavrov and Putin, I think they do distinctly represent the, the civil side of the civil-military relationship. So you're talking to the two people who can halt the bombs. You're talking to the two people who can stop the war. You need to talk to them with a good set of diplomatic goals, and you need to get this thing at a at least a negotiated ceasefire, and then talks. And you need to start talking before the momentum of the war, as Clausewitz so clearly points out, and as every war I've ever studied points out, carries new objectives into being, carries new strategies into being, tells Russia, well, I can go a little bit further here. Uh, maybe I could even go all the way to the borders of NATO, all the way up north to south. Um, who knows? I don't think they would do that, but it's a possibility. And we're making it ever more a possibility by allowing him to continue. The leader of this AFD alternative for Germany recently, he was talking about Dexit, which comes from Brexit. What's going on in Germany right now? I think you're talking about an early example with German characteristics of exactly what I mean and what Powell meant in 1989 when I first joined him about NATO falling apart and possibly the EU falling apart. It never has been able to get its political act, political act together. And, and the way it's compensated for that in many respects, it's become more and more authoritarian and less and less democratic. If the EU is to get its act in place, and if the rest of NATO is to salvage some of itself, if any, then it's got to go to Germany for the leadership, for the quality, for the oomph to do it. And what you just described, Germany is not ready to do it. Germany's ready to do the opposite. So I think as goes Germany in that regard, so is going to go France, Belgium, and ultimately the original countries of NATO. And we're going to have the fulfillment of what Colin Powell predicted for me in 1989 in Atlanta, we're going to have the dissolution of NATO and maybe the European Union with it. Um, the Union's never really solved its political problem. It still has a major political problem. You look at us and you say, we've got problems, but you look at our state structure, our federal structure, we've got a common language. Some would say in Texas, we don't, or you know, some other places. But basically, we've solved the problems of having such a conglomerate society in a federal way. EU hadn't settled that. They still got all the problems that they had, you know, 100 years ago, attenuated somewhat, but lurking in the shadows all the time. And when you start talking about bringing, this is one of the problems I have with the extension of NATO. When you start bringing Poland in, and you start bringing Albania in, and you start bringing Montenegro in, you, even Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, you bring them in. A lot of Russians there, a lot of disquietude there, a lot of language problems, and a lot of people who don't want two languages or three languages even. You, you just bring these problems in to a place where you are possessed of nuclear weapons, thank you very much, and where you have guaranteed the security of all is the security of me and you. And this is not good, what we've done. And I, I fought Bill Clinton for having started it and done it. You know, Bill Perry actually left his administration partly because of the expansion of NATO. Um, the only really sound, sane Secretary of Defense we've had in a long, long time. 
He knew what was happening and he knew what it would do to Russia. He knew what, how Russia would react, as did George Kennan and Henry Kissinger and a host of others. So we painted this. We've done this. This portrait is out there that we constructed. Um, and now we're living with the results of it. We need to unravel some of this. We need to do it fairly rapidly. We need to start by stopping the war in Ukraine and then turning to Germany with some kind of uh, rapprochement in mind in terms of what we've done to them and try to help them to be the strong man of Europe, perhaps, but be the strong man in a peaceful way. Because I don't see Germany's evolution being all that good for Europe if it goes the way you're hinting that the uh, alternative for Deutschland might put its platform up to do. Fight Russia? The Germans want to fight Russia again? Haven't they had enough of that? Um, I'm sorry, you, you'd get the same thing handed to you you got handed to you before, your state. You know, Boris Johnson recently published a video. This is the guy who sabotaged the, the talks between Russia and Ukraine in, in Istanbul. He's just tried to convince the young people to join the military to fight Russia. Do you see these type of politicians going to get stronger in Europe? They're going to get weaker in your opinion? I put them in the same class as I put Lindsey Graham and Tom Cotton and a host of others. Cotton may have a little bit of experience in the military, but he didn't get any experience that counted. Um, and I, I call them fair weather soldiers. I mean, Tom Paine talked about them uh, when Washington was having troubles at Valley Forge. He wrote that pamphlet that Washington said was more powerful than anything else. It was worth two divisions of soldiers to have that pamphlet circulating through the camps. Um, I think we're at a point where we have a lot of people like that in the world now. And I would put some prime ministers and presidents in those categories. And it, it is scary from the point of view that, one, they know absolutely nothing of which they speak, particularly with regard to war and military operations. Two, the world is... It, the Bank of International Settlements issued a paper recently that said there was over $34 trillion in the world that wasn't substantially supported. And then put an addendum on it that said maybe it was twice that much. Well, a good share of that, of course, is ours and Chile's and Argentina's and Malaysia's and all manner of countries in the world. Um, what are we going to do about this global debt that is so unsurpassed right now and our own, which is 34 trillion plus and growing every day? That's $100,000 for every American citizen. You imagine what they'd think out in Peoria if you walked up to their house and said, present me with a check for $100,000 right now because uh, we've got to pay our debt off. Uh, impossible. I can't do that. I'm sorry. That's what our debt is. The world is in such bad shape right now, and it is accompanied by sorry leadership, especially in the West. One of the reasons I think Putin is doing as well as he's doing is because he's not a sorry leader. I don't care what you think about his government style or about his killing his enemies and everything. That's, you know, it's, it, it, it's uh, heinous, if you will, if it's, if it's all true. But it's not necessarily an inhibition to him being smart and thinking diplomatically and professionally, uh, militarily well. I think he does. So we're, we're looking at a competition between, and this is, this is always amazing to me, Xi Jinping, for example, who's pretty competent with what he does, Putin, who's pretty competent with what he does, a few more like them in the world, and we're calling that dictatorship because we and authoritarianism because we just don't like it. It just doesn't fit in our lexicon. And on the other hand, we're talking about what wonderful, stable, economically successful, uh, incredibly respective of human rights. Oh, anybody for a little Gaza? Um, that we are. And the dichotomy is astonishing. It is astonishing. And meanwhile, there's 4 billion people plus in the world who are looking at that and making their decisions on who or what they might want to align with, either in the future or even today. And so what are we doing to ourselves? We're alienating ourselves. We're alienating, ourse alienating ourselves because we have such poor leadership, such poor policies, and even... When there's a decent policy, we execute it so sloppily it doesn't carry out. It doesn't do anything. Look at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, for example. Here we had 
the Israelis come in, as I knew they would. I knew they would. I could have I could have told you if you'd interviewed me on that day. I, they're going to do that. They're going to do that. They come in and they say that of some 13,000 workers, 12, I think, collaborated with Hamas. Well, quickly the next day they had to say, oh, there's more. It's probably 10% of them because they realized that was such a minuscule bunch of people out of 13,000 workers in a situation like that. Let's face it, UNRWA has no intelligence agency. It has no security force. It can't check on people. Guess what it does? It sends the people it hires in a list to Israel because they do have security forces. They do have intelligence forces, and they can check them. Israel. <laughs> so Israel was commenting on its own inability to say, yeah, that worker should stay, that one should go. Uh, this is crazy. And we let them get away with it. And now we have stopped payments to the only organization on the earth that has the capacity to deal with the carnage in Gaza right now. I'm not even sure they do, but no one else certainly does. They have the closest ability to do it. And we're holding money up. This is insane. We're letting Netanyahu run us like we were a bull with a ring in our nose. You talk about Netanyahu. It seems that they agreed on a ceasefire in Gaza. Is it going to be something permanent? Is it going to be something for a few months? How do you find it right now? I think President Biden and his staff, and I think the Congress, at least the sane members, and I won't tell you what percentage I think that is, really want it. And I think what's going to happen, if they're smart, is they're going to use this ceasefire, whether it's a week, a month, whatever. I think it's probably going to come down on the longer side to get rid of Netanyahu. Once they've done that, then they can use that ceasefire to contemplate the aftermath. And without Netanyahu, without his shrill voice, without his abnegation of everything they want to do, without his uh, criminality even, without the kind of lies that I think they created about UNRWA, for example, um, maybe, maybe something out of that ceasefire can lead to a real viable pathway that would lead us to two states or lead us to a solution to the problem that we've got. It isn't a solution to just stop, rebuild Gaza, however helter-skelter, crazily we might do it, and then say, okay, let's go for another 10, 20 years with the Israelis doing what they've been doing for the last 10 or 20 years. It'll just start over again, probably quicker than this last time. Um, so we've got to have a viable solution, and you've got to work it out in this ceasefire so that at least the world and the Palestinians in particular, and the Arab countries too, see that you're serious and there's a plan that might work and that they can support with money and and political support if you remember the day after october 7th each and every party in israel was so united behind the netanyahu administration do you see a bright future for netanyahu and his administration i do not i think they're going to get rid of him as i said and i think they're going to put him i think the courts are going to put him in jail or they'll do like they did with uh Arik sharon He'll have cancer or something and have to die. Uh, <laughs> I don't say that lightheartedly, but they don't seem to like to put their prime ministers in jail afterwards. Um, I think that you've got to get rid of him in order to have any chance of others having the wiggle room, the political wiggle room, um, to do anything, to do anything that might at least initially cost them political points, but ultimately will not just add political points, it'll add to the possibility Israel might be a state beyond this moment. I, it's fragile right now. I think it's very fragile. And if the war expands, if Netanyahu is allowed, for example, if he heard you and me talking right now and he thought that someone would listen to us and be serious about reacting to what we're saying, he'd attack Hezbollah tomorrow morning. He'd bring them into the war. He'd widen the war himself. That's how deadly this man is. When he thinks that he's going and that guard is waiting outside the room to put the handcuffs on him, you got to be careful now. You better be willing to grab a hold of him quickly because he'll widen the war. And I'm not so sure watching Biden doing what he's doing right now, both in Yemen and elsewhere in the region with these jet strikes and Bombs dropping. Bombs never did anything for anybody in the whole history of warfare, except make the people upon whom the bombs fell mad as hell at you 
and vow for the next hundred years to be after you. That's about what it did. Look at what we, we dropped more bombs, more dumb bombs, not precision bombs, on North Vietnam than we dropped on Germany in World War II. Who won that fracas? Yeah. It's insanity what he's doing. You're not sending any message to anybody except that you are stupid and keep dropping the bombs and you will get a verdict from the world that you are stupid. Why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because we want to obfuscate. We want to camouflage. We think we can. The reason that these people are doing this, the war in Gaza. That's, you know, that's Biden's hope that he can, oh, I want to keep a regional war from going, but I'm going to drop a lot of bombs on a lot of people. I'm going to get really close to Iran because they've guaranteed me they won't attack back unless one of those bombs actually goes on Iranian soil. Uh, and by the way, you'll forget about the war in Gaza. Well, no, the world's not going to forget about the war in Gaza. It's there. And the world's not stupid. It knows the reason these other people are reacting is because of what? the Israelis are doing, and we're supporting in Gaza. You, know, you talk about bombing Iran. How serious is that, in your opinion? And how do you find the Biden administration's policy right now for the situation that we're witnessing in the Middle East, in the Red Sea? They are connected to this conflict in Gaza. We cannot pretend that they're not related to each other. They're all so connected to each other. Netanyahu, right now, he's looking for something to help him. It seems to me any conflict that the U.S. start in the Middle East would benefit him, at least for the short time. I think you're right. I think he would take a war with Iran in a heartbeat. I think he would uh, even be responsible for instigating it if he could. Uh, I think the Iranians are smarter than he is right now. I don't think the Iranians want a war. I think they're going to let a lot happen before they actually do anything that might look like we'd have to respond with a real war. Um, I worry, though, that some of these bombs might hit some people that uh, they aren't necessarily want, wanting to lose, um, particularly Quds Force or, you know, people like uh, we hit in Iraq before, General Soleimani. Um, you never know. Again, the vagaries of war can change in a 24-hour period. Hell, they can change in a minute. We used to call that the CNN effect. You know, we had an example of it in, in Somalia, in Mogadishu. Uh, during uh, Clinton's first year in, in office, um, we were actually winning tactically on the ground. We had killed more of them than they had killed of, of us. And we were closing in on Muhammad, Far Muhammad Faradid, the warlord we wanted to get. But that imbroglio that happened inside Mogadishu with the warrant officer dragged through the street and burned bodies and everything, that turned the American people off. And Bill Clinton beat his feet from that war as fast as he possibly could. So what I'm saying is the CNN effect, you know, we called it then the camera and the American people see that and they say, oh, why are we there? Get out of that place. Uh, that's the kind of effect you can have. And this is a place you could have that kind of effect all around Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Iran itself, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. Suppose Iran shot one of those missiles like it shot before or a bevy of them. And uh, Saudi uh, Ras Tanura, for example, where the million of barrels per day production capacity is probably one of the greatest in the world. And you suddenly shut that down 25%, 30% or somewhere. We simulated that in Beijing in, 20, in 2009 with the Chinese and others. Uh, pretty bad situation. You got to start shifting petroleum products all over the world. We were shifting North Slope uh, oil from Britain to the United States, shifting Alaskan oil to Korea and doing all manner of things to compete with that. We At the at the end of the first day, we had oil at $300 a barrel. Remember, this is 2009, too. We had oil at $300 a barrel, and we had uh, West Texas Intermediate and Brent Crude were about $300, $305 a barrel. And we had shippers who wouldn't ship, and we had insurers who wouldn't insure. How do you see the popularity of Netanyahu and his administration right now in the Biden administration, in the U.S. government? Biden used the F word about him, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I don't know if that was a coherent moment or not, but I'm for it. <laughs> it seems that Biden is getting tired of Netanyahu and his administration. I think what we're going to see, I hope what we're going to see is an ultimatum. I think Biden is going to say, Netanyahu goes or I go. 
And that will mean immediate departure for Bibi. There's no question about that. They cannot continue this without us. That's the really dreadful thing about this. We are enabling it now 100%. We have one of the largest war stock reserves in the world for us in Israel. And we have a deal. Whenever they're in extremists, they can borrow from those war stocks. Well, they're borrowing big time from those war stocks. They could not wage this war at the pace and with the uh, viciousness that they're waging it without those stocks. So if, if Biden says he goes or we, we quit, he would go. He would go within the hour. There wouldn't hardly be a discussion. Then you got the problem of the next person, whomever it might be, what is he going to do? And what are you going to tell him if he doesn't comply with your wishes? Well, I say you do the same thing with him. You're gone too, or I'm out of here. You understand you're in an existential situation. You will disappear if I'm not here because your own people will eat your lunch when they find out that you've driven the United States 100% completely away. That will be anathema for you in this country. And believe me, it would be. Um, then someone's got to take note and they've got to change policies, at least to the point where the president can accept them. That's what he needs to do. Not just call him the F word from Washington to his face and, you know, gone. You're gone. Out of here. I would even see it this way. I would go to Jerusalem. President Biden, President Wilkerson goes to Jerusalem. I'd say, I want to have a meeting alone with your prime minister. Maybe the agents are in there, Secret Service on the president's side. I would look at Netanyahu and I would say, Mr. Netanyahu, President Netanyahu, your departure is imminent. If it's not, I'm gone. And everything that I give you and support you with is gone too. Give me your decision within the next one minute. And if he didn't say within a minute, I'm gone, then I'd open the meeting to the rest of the cabinet and present the same thing to him in front of the cabinet. And I'd want that to get into the press too, that, that I had done that forcefully, dynamically, and to his face. When you look at the U.S. policy from the right and left, from the Democratic Party and, and Republican Party, are they going to get to the point that they would need an alternative in Israel? Well, to a certain extent, Netanyahu is eating his own lunch. And by that, I mean, he engineered the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, the last best hope Israel had for a two-state solution and a peaceful existence reasonably alongside a Palestinian state. When he did that, he not only enlivened and gave blood juice to all the zealots in Israel, especially those in Likud, his political party, who now control it. He also convinced the other group, not necessarily labor as labor, but that group that, you know, held their nose and most often voted for labor rather than Likud or one of the other parties. He gave them the faith not the love. They don't love him at all. He gave them the faith that he would give them two things, a booming economy, which he did on Mark Rich's discounted oil stolen from Saddam Hussein, and then a whole litany of crimes after that to keep that oil flowing in with our complicity. Thank you very much. And he gave them security until October 7th. Now they've all questioned that pact, you know, he never won with very much of the vote. It was a squeaky win almost every time. That was the edge in that was these people who made the pact with him. Keep me safe and make me rich. And he did for all the period of time by essentially crushing all opposition everywhere he saw it and stealing things like oil and like gas and so forth from the Palestinians. He's stealing from anybody he could get it from. Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad. It's, it's time for his comeuppance. It's time for his comeuppance. And if Israel doesn't issue it to him, if the United States forces it 
that's one thing. If they were to issue it to him themselves, it'd be another thing entirely. I think that'd be a lot more healthy, but I don't think they're going to do it. So we need to do it. But either way, it's got to be issued. And maybe the state of Israel can be saved from itself. I'm not sure. But that's the only way. Because Netanyahu has become death. He is their end. And they need to get rid of him before it becomes their true end. Recently, Japan and Germany signed a treaty to contain China. And is that reasonable right now to do such a thing? Japan's demographics mean it'll disappear in the next 50 years. Has a fabulous military. Um, probably one of the best militaries in the world. But hasn't engaged in any kind of real combat in a long time. China is... One what 1.5, 1.4 billion people can put 2 million men in the field, men and women in the field almost immediately. Um, I was recently reading about how Japan got so buried in China in the 30s and how Japan sort of, to a certain extent, crafted its own fate when it went for Pearl Harbor in 1941. The United States had put all kinds of embargoes on it, so hastened that fate to be sure, and therefore was partly responsible for the war in the Pacific. But Japan had so mired itself in China and Manchuria that it was it was just bleeding itself to death, and and it had to break out the other way, or it was going to you know go down completely, sucked into China, and China wasn't China today. China today would have eaten Japan's lunch. So I don't think any kind of alliance, minus the United States now, and that's principally because of our nuclear weapons, is going to do much to deter China. Not only that, I don't think Xi Jinping has any interest whatsoever in Korea or Japan, except as economic partners. And the better economic partners they are, the more he'll like them. Just recently, the defense minister of China said they're totally supporting Russia for the fight in Ukraine. It's a huge statement by China. When you look at the policy of the neocons, it's totally disastrous. I don't understand the logic behind these kind of policies. Frederick Hartman, in his book, The Relations of Nations, he was a brilliant professor at Newport um, just before I was there as a student, the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, the sixth edition contains uh, a preface in a first chapter, which lists some of the principles that he says belong to the field of the relations of nations, international relations. One of them, which I've mentioned to you before, I think, is called the conservation of enemies. And it's simply stated as a prudent nation will take care that it doesn't have any more enemies at any one time than it can manage. <laughs> we are not a prudent nation. We are simply not a prudent nation. We have forced Beijing and Moscow into an alliance. It's more than tacit now. I think it is a genuine alliance. One of my Japanese colleagues emailed me from Tokyo recently and told me that he's just heard that the Chinese have broken out extensively now and actually have gotten about double what they had in nuclear warheads. They had, we thought, somewhere between 400 and 600. That means 800 to 1,200. Um, that's a fast move, a really fast move. The only way they probably could have done that is with Russian assistance. This alliance, it, it's like when uh, Biden uh, went to the president of South Korea and forced him to send those rounds to Ukraine. The next thing Putin did was give North Korea the technology to build a missile, which they have done now, that'll hit Los Angeles, Washington, Chicago, Atlanta, wherever they want to hit in the United States with reasonable precision with a nuclear warhead. Um, this is what you get when you do things, you know, aha, got you, you know, and then the other person very calmly, that's the reason I say Putin and Lavrov are smart, very calmly, they come back and say, oh, you did that? Watch what I do. Uh, they're tit for tat. Only the tats that they give our tits are bigger <laughs> and they're worse. We are becoming isolated. We're becoming the pariah nation. We're becoming the one the rest of the world learns to hate and to gang up with others to do something about. The group of, uh, what are we calling it now? Um, geez, we, we used to call it the non-aligned movement. It was about 77 countries. I, I forget what they're calling it now. Maybe it's still called that, but 
there are different groups out there that are forming essentially motivated by the fact that they see us. They see what we're doing. They see how many people in the world we have sanctioned, over 2 billion. We see how we throw our weight around with bombs and other things in the world. And they don't like it. And I don't blame them. And so they begin to form alliances, tacit and real, like China and Moscow. And they're ready to balance us. That is the relations of nations. I don't know if you've seen the new interview of the Burkina Faso's interim president, in which he says that France had no desire to fight terrorists during their years-long counterterrorism operation in his country. I think there are basically two phenomena in Africa, particularly in the Sahel, that goes along with foreign militaries, including the United States and African Command. One is much the same template we had during the Cold War. And that is that we would go in and find an African leader in an African country and say, um, we'll give you millions of dollars to enhance the capabilities of your military and such, as long as you are staunchly anti-communist. And that ruler would give the military the money and oppress his own people with that military. And we would say, oh, that's okay, as long as you're not a communist, as long as you're anti-communist. And this was the case all across Africa. You may remember Henry Kissinger got really soiled hands and some of that. Um, the other template is we go in and we say it's economic aid, and the French are no different. Uh, I, I dealt with the French down in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, and I, you know, God, don't even get me started on that. Um, the other is we'll give you economic aid. Well, the economic aid turns out to be aid to those people in your country who are allied with giant corporations in the West, whether it be France, Germany, America, Canada, whatever, and are going to make for those people a sizable profit and for themselves a little kickback. And so pretty soon you got two and you got people who don't like that situation. They don't understand the fundamentals of it. But increasingly, because of the media and the Internet and so forth, the women in particular in Africa are beginning to understand the fundamental fundamentals of that. So, for example, when Blinken goes to Davos and talks about all these wonderful agricultural programs they're going to start in Eritrea and Ethiopia and everything else, the people there, especially the women, go, yeah, tell me again the story, Tony boy, because they know what it means. It means they're going to be exploited, probably even worse than the Chinese exploit them. Um, and that's a real eye-opener sometimes for African countries. What do you do about it? Well, the first thing you do, if you're the United States and you care, is you pull the military out. The military has no business being in Africa under a counterterrorism rhetoric or under a counter-communism rhetoric or whatever it might be, and certainly not under a state-building rhetoric because we proved from Afghanistan to Iraq to a host of other places we do not build states worth a damn. We need to get out. We need to get out of the Middle East. We need to get out of Africa. Putting Africa command and military in Africa as our principal policy tool was an absolute mistake, total mistake, disaster. Um, what, what you'll see happening in Africa is more and more the same because of that kind of... The French pulled out. The French pulled out. And I don't blame them. I'd pull out too. We need to get out. Every GI... Every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, space forceman, whatever it is in the Middle East right now, over 50,000 of them, has a real red bullseye on their back. And now, not only the bullseye, but someone taking aim. Those three who were killed in Jordan, beginning. Unless we get them out. We need to get them out. We have no business having troops on the ground in the Middle East, and we have the most troops on the ground in the Middle East of any place in the world. The other statement that he made during this interview, he said, before the French-led NATO invasion of Libya in 2011, there were virtually no violent events recorded in the Sahel region of Africa. But after the NATO war concluded, violence across the region soared. Right now, when you look at the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya, how did that work out for the United States and its allies? We came, we saw, he died. That's how Hillary answered that question. Um, most impolitic remark in the history of diplomacy post-World War II. Hillary was a, a, a total failure. Um, why we did that is still beyond me. Beyond, remember, I left the administration that had made a deal with Gaddafi. We had broken the AQ Khan network. We had gotten a lot of countries, more countries than you might be comfortable with, 
to say they weren't going to build nuclear weapons, including Libya. Libya was ready, Gaddafi was ready to sit down and have lunch with Condi Rice, the national security advisor. Uh, and the next thing I know, the Norwegians, the Norwegians are leading the bombing runs on Libya. When I asked Norway that, they, they said, well, you know, our country has really changed. I, I know those young men, that was the first time they'd ever dropped iron bombs out of an F-16 or whatever. So, it, you know, it was a real thrill for them. But that is not an image that Norway needed to create for itself. And we made a disaster there. Gaddafi and Egypt. Egypt at one end, Gaddafi at the other, were kind of keeping the lid on the pressure cooker. And they were making sure that people were reasonably taken care of, not rich mongrels or anything like that. But, you know, they were reasonably well taken care of. Gaddafi even wanted to establish his own monetary standard for the AU or for at least that part of Africa. He had some really grandiose plans. Again, I come back to the proposition that all of these dictators are not necessarily evil people the way sometimes our own leaders are evil people. We took him out. We came, we saw, he died. And now what do we got? We got a mess from, I, I, I was listening to El Sisi the other day, and he's talking about what needs to be done with regard to this very situation, because he sees the whole rim of Africa becoming destabilized. And people flowing out, of course. What happens to the Libyans who leave really early in the morning, leave the coast on rickety boats for Italy now? Italian Coast Guard turn them around or accept them? Well, it was accepting a lot of them, but I'm understanding now that it's turning them around. Well, these rickety boats usually don't make it back to Libya. So where do those people go? Hmm. Same place people go in the Red Sea when they get on the rickety boat to go to Africa or the other way around when the wars are really bad in Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. They go the other way. They get on these rickety boats. They drown in the middle of the Red Sea and nobody says squat. That's how to get rid of uh, your excess population. Larry, just to wrap up this session, I want to talk about Imran Khan. He was sentenced to a 10-year prison. What's going on in his country? The majority of people in Pakistan are not agreeing with what's going on right now in their country. You're asking me a question about a country that is just so wrapped up in what's happening now and what's happened in the past and what's happened in the past past that it's very difficult to answer the question because i i mean here's pervez musharraf in the room with colin powell when musharraf was both president and head of the military and all the rest of the things he was doing at that time and trying to explain to powell why it's essential that he do what he's doing but he'll stop doing it someday well that's the mantra of the Pakistani military once they take over the government. And if they're not in the government, if they haven't got the government, if they don't have a Musharraf as the president, then they're plotting against the civilians who are in the government. And they're going to get what they want if they had the military guy in there. But they don't. They got a civilian. So if the civilian isn't forthcoming, they got to get rid of him. So they're the real power, along with the Pakistani intelligence service, ISI, which we found out big time in Afghanistan. If it weren't for the ISI, we might still be in Afghanistan. That's the only good thing I can say about it. Um, and so Pakistan goes through these, you know, Turkey used to be a sort of like this, but Turkey, Erdogan, at least for, for one good thing, he sort of stabilized it for a long period of time. Now he's gotten rid of a lot of the reforms that were made in the beginning that caused the military to, you know, come in and go out, come in and go out. But Pakistan's never figured this out to the extent that they can leave a civilian in the presidency for any length of time and have the military accept it. And they deal with it either one or two ways. They put the president in. Oh, he's going to get elected again. Let's put him in jail. And the rest of the establishment, so accustomed to doing the military and intelligence services wishes, goes along with it. It's a very, uh, I don't know, I, uh, Ibn, the Ibn Khaldun professor of Islamic studies at American University is, uh, he used to be, I think he was the administrator of Baluchistan when he was in Pakistan. And he was the high commissioner from Pakistan to the United Kingdom at one time. So this is no 
fading rose in terms of professorship in academia. I mean, he's been in the real world. Anybody who's been in Baluchistan has been in the real world. Um, and you know, I think he would say, Akbar Ahmed's his name, I think he would say, I sometimes despair of my home country. But from everything I saw, he was trying to do some of the right things. And they didn't correspond with what the military wanted. The reason behind all of these difficulties that he's experiencing right now was his trip to Moscow. Could be the fact that we picked up the phone and said, you got to get rid of that guy. And the Pakistanis only know one way to get rid of him, put him in jail. Or or like they did with Benazir Bhutto, mm, the graveyard. <laughs>